That was brilliant. So it's a real pleasure to be here today to talk to you about collective behavior. And uh, what a brilliant venue. Fantastic. Thanks so much for the invitation. Um, so yes, yeah, so I'm going to talk to you about collective behavior in the animal world and then how this can help us understand our own societies. And so one of the great things about studying collective behavior is that it's beautiful. And that actually is how I got involved in the study. I was first interested in the art of collective behavior, and then my interest in science came later. Now, I want you to guess what this is. Just shout out if anyone has an idea what this phenomenon is we're looking at. Yeah, it's fish. So this is all fish. If we zoom in a little bit, what you're actually looking at here is collective behavior of sharks hunting, schooling prey. So I just flew in from the Maldives yesterday, and this is data that my uh, student sent me this morning, and I thought I'd share it with you. And what we're also doing, so this is filmed using a drone, um, but we also have another drone that zoomed in, looking at the details of these interactions. And so you can see that, in actual fact, that kind of smoke in the background were millions and millions of schooling fish that have evolved within this huge collective. And we know very little about how these collectives function. To my knowledge, this is the first time groups of this size have ever been studied. Um, and collective behavior, I think one of the engaging things about it is that we see it all around us. We see flocking birds and schooling fish. And many of you may have wondered about ants. So here are blind army ants forming a living bridge, a living architecture out of their bodies. So unlike us humans, they have an adaptable infrastructure, bridges, even scaffolding to stop the ants from falling. Elsewhere in the natural world, we have phenomena such as these locust swarms that really impact the livelihood of humans on the planet. And that's where I'll start today. I'll start with our research on trying to understand what on earth is causing these types of aggregations and what can we do about them. And so these swarms can be billions of individuals, some of the largest groups in nature. And these can be devastating because seemingly out of nowhere, suddenly there are these biblical plagues of insects. And during COVID, partly driven by COVID, the difficulty in moving people and resources around, we had some of the worst swarms in East Africa for the last 70 years. We're not really getting better at understanding these phenomena, and climate change is actually making these swarms larger and more extreme. And it's extremely expensive and difficult to control these insects. So what you might be surprised to know about is that actually locusts start forming swarms as soon as they hatch from eggs. So here you can see time-lapse footage of the locusts in the lab, and they'll march together. But look, they don't even have wings. So for the first stages of their lives, so like all insects, they grow and then they shed their skin, they grow and then they shed their skin multiple times. And it's only the final stage of adulthood that they can actually take flight. So we need to understand how and why these groups form in the wingless form first. And here you can see them marching in unison. As far as you can see, locusts marching together. And so people thought, well, this must be cooperative. They must be working together for some good of the insects. But one of the great things about doing biology is that we get many surprises when we look at these experimental systems. So I do my field research in Mauritania in West Africa. I'll show you some pictures shortly. And this one species of locust, the desert locust, can actually invade up to one-eighth of the Earth's land surface during plague years. And this zone is expanding again due to climate change. And so the Food and Agricultural Organization of the United Nations estimates that they impact the livelihood of one in 10 people on the planet. Now, that's kind of astonishing, given that there's only around three or four research groups in the world studying these animals. 
Why is that? It's because they're affecting poor countries, countries where people cannot afford chemicals to control the animals. And also, they're contributing massively to humanitarian crises in, across Africa. And Martin Enserink in Science wrote that even after 50 years, fighting locusts is more of an art than a science. That's kind of embarrassing, because many of us in Europe would have had locusts in our classrooms. It's other than Drosophila, which is a fruit fly, it's one of the best studied animals at the individual level. Yet no one since the 1950s had put them together to see how and why they formed swarms. So we wanted to address this challenge. And so what we did was we created a particle accelerator, so to speak, of locusts. They're not the smartest animals out there. They will march around this environment thinking they're in a never-ending <laughs> desert environment. And I developed software to track the motion of the individuals that allows us to really measure how they're interacting with each other. And we found that they only interact over around 15 to 20 centimeters, yet you could see the swarms forming across hundreds of square kilometers. And what we found was simply by changing the density of the locust. So as the population grows, they transition from disorder on the left, where the locusts aren't really creating a problem for people. They're kind of disordered and not really going anywhere. So on the right, as you increase density, they spontaneously form what are called marching bands, these bands that sweep through. And a bit like a wildfire, you know, it's really the density of these insects suddenly coming into your farming area that can destroy the livelihood of so many people. And of course, this is exacerbated by the fact that we're growing crops and, um, and you know, using water to grow these crops allows the population densities to get very, very high. So there's no attempt to try to exterminate the locusts. They play a very important ecological role. But can we begin to understand why they form swarms? And can that inform us how we can better help people in these areas? So here we have the non-swarming to the swarming insects as we increase the density. But why do they swarm? It looks cooperative, but in fact, is it? That had never been tested. And so working with my, my first PhD student, Sepede Bazazi, we tried to understand this phenomenon. And what we realized was these so-called vegetarian insects would frequently bite each other. And so maybe they're not so friendly to each other as was thought. They're highly aggressive animals. And in fact, in our experiments, it was very common to see the type of damage you see on the left there. Now, for a desert insect, this could be fatal to lose hemolymph, the equivalent of blood for these animals. And you can see the poor locust bee there is doomed. And so this had not been observed before, the fact that these insects seem to be cannibalistic. And so Sepede did experiments where she could cut a little window into the cuticle of a locust and then cut the nerves that give it sensation to the abdomen, so they can no longer feel the biting of the insects behind them. And these are tough animals. We sealed it up again, and we couldn't see any change in individual behavior. They ate the same way, they marched, they, they walked around in the same way as individuals. And we, of course, did what are called control experiments, where we replicated this, we cut a little window in, or Sepede cut a little window in, and tickled the nerve with a paintbrush, but didn't cut it. So we could compare these control insects versus the insects that had the nerve cut. And what we found was the nerve-cut individuals, over time, shown in red here, they became quiescent, and they were indistinguishable from locusts that were not interacting at all. Conversely, the insects that could feel the biting of others became more active and formed a swarm. So by removing the ability to sense the biting of others coming from behind, we could completely prevent the swarm from forming. 
So this indicates it's not a cooperative act. Now, this is a controlled lab experiment, and I wanted to test these ideas in the real world. So this is why I went to Mauritania. There had been a locust outbreak. And indeed, working with our Mauritanian colleagues, we were able to find a swarm of these insects. But it was surprisingly difficult. It took about two and a half days driving through this beautiful desert to find these insects. Because typically, if they find them, they will apply insecticide. So I had to try to explain, no, please don't kill them. I actually want them alive, just a small swarm. It was only about 15 kilometers, so it's quite a small swarm. Um, and I persuaded them to let me study it for a couple of months. And here's one on, uh, you can see this beautiful red eye and beautiful coloration of these insects. And that's me filming the locusts. And that's one of my colleagues, Abdallahai al-Baba, and that's our camel that was taking our, uh, our equipment with us. A very grumpy animal, but I became quite, uh, quite attached to him. Um, and you can see the footfalls of locusts in the sand in the background. And this is the camel close up. <laughs> but it turns out I'm not very good at field biology, because even though I had plenty of money with me, because there was a locust swarm, there was a plague of locusts, there was a famine. And so it didn't matter how much money you had. It was really hard in these remote areas to buy any food whatsoever. And I'd actually been a vegetarian for over a decade prior to this trip. Um, and the only food we could get hold of were camel entrails, the intestines of a camel. This is not our camel. Our camel was not harmed. <laughs> this is another camel. But you can see, that, you can see if, you, if you look closely, some flies uh, eating and laying eggs in this. And we dried it in a little tree till it became like a, a jerky, a dried meat. And surprisingly, it didn't taste all that bad. But my body had not been used to meat, uh, and certainly not used to camel entrails, so I became incredibly sick. I honestly didn't know if I was going to make it. <laughs> and you can see how well prepared I was. This was my 50-euro tent. And the Mauritanian colleagues just laughed at me as I had little tent pegs this big in sand, completely useless. So they gave me these, these screws that we could put in. And this is the same tree that we're drying our clothes in, and we had some colleagues come to give us some resources with the vehicle there. And what you're seeing in the background, just after, shortly, I mean, within days of finally feeling better again, what you're seeing is a wall of sand coming towards us, a huge sandstorm. Um, and this is not a sandstorm, this is exactly the same sandstorm taken from satellite data. And so this storm came through for a few days, and literally blew the locusts away. So I was there for about two months, two and a half months. I got 20 minutes worth of data. <laughs> it was <laughs> horrific. Um, but it does just show you how challenging it can be to study these types of animals. So working with my colleagues, uh, Greg Sword, Steve Simpson, and Pat Lorch, we turned to the good old US of A, where they have things like roads, uh, to study what are called Mormon crickets. So you can see them forming a swarm, and you can see one chowing down on its buddy, and it's dragging the corpse along with it. And it will climb up a bit like a jaguar taking prey into a tree. To get out of the swarm, it will climb up something to feed on the individual. And they'll actually create slicks in the roads. It can be quite dangerous. And the reason they're called Mormon crickets is that the Mormon settlers by the Great Salt Lake um, in Utah, uh, everything was going fine. The settlement was expanding. But then suddenly, there was a huge plague of these crickets that nearly wiped them out. And then God sent a huge flock of seagulls from the Great Salt Lake that fed on the crickets and saved them. So if you go to the Mormon temple uh, in Salt Lake City, you will see the seagull, which is the state bird of Utah, which saved them, surrounded by this beautiful stonework showing the Mormon crickets. And indeed, we found these seagull flocks coming in from the Great Salt Lake to feed on these insects. So again, they were previously thought to be vegetarian, but here they're eating a roadkill rabbit. And the rabbit normally has ears about the length of its body. You can see they've almost chewed the ears off, and they're crawling in through the eyes and in through the mouth to eat this individual. Pretty gruesome. <laughs> and they would also, as I said, frequently eat each other. 
And so we conducted experiments where we manipulated the protein in P to carbohydrate ratio in artificial diets. Everybody thought they're vegetarian, therefore they should go for carbohydrates. But here, you can see this has got protein and carbohydrates, carbohydrate, protein, and this is like the McDonald's of a, a locust or cricket diet. It's got no nutritional value whatsoever. <laughs> and so you can see that the zero nutrition diet was preferred exactly the same as carbohydrate. By the way, they taste with their feet, so they don't even need to taste it um, to eat. But as we add protein further and further still, you can see that the, the crickets love it. They really love protein. Now, of course, I randomized the experiment, but because the effect was so strong, here is a living histogram looking at their preference for salt. So this is just water, and this is very concentrated, two molar concentration, extremely concentrated salt, but you can see them fighting over 0.25 molar. That's their preferred salt concentration, which lo and behold, turns out to be exactly the concentration of their blood. <laughs> so they're finely tuned to a cannibalistic lifestyle. Now, if you're in a desert environment, you run short of essential nutrients like water, salt, and protein. They're really hard to find in the environment. What better than a perfectly packaged, exactly the right balance of nutrients <laughs> is another individual of the same species. And so we discovered that they're not cooperative. They're actually on a forced march. Everyone is trying to attack those ahead and trying to avoid being eaten from those behind. And the outcome is an emergent swarm that forms. Stop and you risk being cannibalized. <laughs> so it goes to show that coordinated behavior need not be cooperative behavior. And I jumped over to these Mormon crickets, but since then, we did go back and showed that the same phenomena is at work with the locust swarms. Okay, so that's an example of an insect swarm that really does impact humanity. But it was a bit disappointing to me because I've always been interested in swarms and flocks because, you know, there's lots of people, they're called neuroscientists, that study the individual <laughs> brain. But relatively few people study this network of connections that interconnect brains together. And if you think about it, it's quite surprising, because if, you know, the model organisms that humans tend to study are organisms like rats, pigeons, of course, humans. They're all highly social. And so I've been really interested in how brains in the individual get connected and what that leads to in terms of the relationship between individual computation and collective computation. And that's what I'm going to focus on in the rest of today's talk. And you can see the, the interplay of these interactions, which I still find beautiful. I watch these videos all the time, and I never tire of it. Um, but what we really want to do is to try to get inside the head of the individual to try and understand how he or she behaves the way they do. That allowed us to create swarms virtual swarms in the computer. And what we could show is that local interactions, you didn't need to have a leader necessarily. These local interactions among individuals were sufficient to create swarms. For example, a local repulsion, a local avoidance of individuals if you get too close. For birds in flight, it can even be fatal to collide. And then a longer range attraction to other individuals. So simple local rules can scale up for what's called emergent collective behaviors. And these models could replicate many of the types of patterns that biologists used to think you needed different rules for each different type of pattern around. So it shows how long ago this is from. But I still think it's beautiful how these swarms, you know, these different patterns can emerge from these local interactions. But now there's a revolution that we're in the midst of. And you've all heard of AI, I'm sure, and artificial intelligence and machine learning and deep neural networks. And so these new technologies allow us to use artificial neural networks to observe the world in completely new ways. So now we can track unmarked individuals 
and the software automatically recognizes who is whom, even though no human could distinguish between them. These are termites. Here are locusts. These are mice. And the software knows exactly which individuals which. Even these fruit flies, these Drosophila, we can recognize all of the individuals. And it allows us to visualize and study collectives in the real world. And it's all free and open source. So this type of technology allows us to explore this ability of collectives. I mean, what's the fundamental process here? It's that the change of behavior of one or a few individuals spreads to others. It's what we call a social contagion. And we can even reconstruct the visual field. So here we're reconstructing the left in red and the right visual field in blue of that focal individual. We can do this for all of the individuals. So we can now see the world from the perspective of the animal. And you can see this is a very complex, time-varying scene driven both by the motion of the focal individual and by the world around changing. Now, what has the brain evolved to do? All brains have evolved to do the same thing. And it's to take in complex information. I mean, I'm looking at this very complex scene in front of me. And to take that and to reduce that complexity down to making decisions. This is called dimensionality reduction because there are many dimensions in the world, different sensory modalities, yet the brain has evolved to make sense of that and to make these decisions. And what we've been able to do is be able to reconstruct the network of communication within these groups. Now, what a neuroscientist would do is they can go into the brain and they can look at the physical and functional connectivity of the neurons that gives rise to individual behavior and individual intelligence. But when we look at animal collectives or social systems, there is no physical form of the, connective, the connections. And so we really need these new technologies to visualize and analyze. And we call these the hidden networks of interaction, networks of communication that have never been seen before. And these tend to be what are called weighted, so strong weights mean that you strongly influence others, but it's also directed. I might be strongly influenced by you, but you not by me. And this is something that's very common in social networks. Again, had not previously been studied. And this is a real fish school, reconstructing these beautiful networks. And they really have remarkable properties. And so over the years, we've been able to show that computation occurs in the brain, of course, but it also can occur by changing the network of interactions. So a bit like a neural network. We've shown that this regulates social contagion, how behavior spreads in groups, modulating behavior in response to increased risk. When the world gets more dangerous, the individuals do not change how they respond. They change the network connectivity, which changes the sensitivity of the collective to inputs. Sensing long-range environmental gradients, we were able to show that no individual in the group can sense the gradient, but the group can. Okay, so it's really a collective effect. And also that these collective properties evolve readily among genetically selfish individuals. Okay, so even though there are many, many differences between these animal groups and, say, a neural network, we're beginning to understand that just like you know, the, the way we have creativity and the reason we're so smart, and any animal is smart, is because they change the weight and the connectivity of the network of communication. Each neuron is relatively simple but have a billion of them working together, and you can have these emergent properties. We're finding the same type of things occurring within these animal collectors. It's just we've never been able to see and study these networks before. And so there's lots of emergent features that they can do. So I told you earlier that they don't need to have leaders to coordinate their behavior. But just like human societies, these animals often live 
in populations where they split and they merge with other individuals and then they can split apart. And so you never know who you're going to be with. And so we've been able to show that individuals within these groups can communicate without requiring signaling and without requiring to know who has and who does not have information. Individuals, for example, that do have information, in this example, we're going to have a preferred direction of travel that is shared by the white individuals. Now, importantly, these individuals are only white so we can see who has information. So it's only for us humans. In the model, we don't assume that anyone knows anything but their own informational state. So they have those simple local rules of avoidance of collisions and attraction to other individuals. But the white individuals also reconcile that with a desire to move in the given direction. And what we can see is without communication, explicit communication, without individual recognition, without signaling, the information was conveyed. Okay, so it shows us that these animals can... can oh, this is, very, this is very exciting. Oh, wonderful. Oh, great. Cheers. Ah, this is the kind of talk I like. Um, especially having been in uh, uh, the Maldives on a dry island for the last couple of weeks. Um, so we could also uh, test these ideas experimentally. So here are fish. The red ones have information about the green laser stimulus the fish normally don't respond to. And you could see the wave of information conveyed among the individuals, even though they don't have complex language or anything like that. And so you can see, as you increase the number of these informed individuals, we increase the accuracy of this information transfer. Now, what about if there's conflict in the group? What if some individuals want to go one way and others want to go in a different direction? This can be very common. How can they reconcile it? What do we do as humans? Well, we vote. So I could ask you a question like, you know, where should we go out later? And some of you could recommend one place, others a different place. I could tally up the votes and we could come to a consensus. But remember, these individuals cannot, to our knowledge, count. And they certainly can't do that complex communication. But what we find is just with these simple local rules, they can resolve this. So here there's an equal number that want to get to the white and the red targets. And as before, the colors are just so we can see who has information. In the model, they start at random positions, random orientations. You don't know if anyone agrees with you or disagrees with you. There's no cheating going on here. But it will be 50-50 because there's an equal number of individuals for each option. So it's random which one they'll choose. In this case, they choose the red. But if I ran that again and again, it would be 50-50. But if I put in just one extra white individual, again, random starting conditions, they will almost always choose the majority preferred target, even though nobody knows if they're in the majority or minority and no individual can count. So again, it's this term emergent. This emergent property of these local interactions allows the group to create a computation that no individual in the group is even aware of. Okay, so they're voting on the move. So when you look at a bird flock or a fish school, what you're really looking at is a sort of fluid computer on the move with the interconnection of the brains of the individuals. And so when I wrote this article back in 2007, I was extremely cautious to draw these connections because surely there can't be a deep connection between the type of communication within these flocks and schools and neural networks because there are so many differences uh, in levels of selection, in terms of the components. But what I want to argue today is that I was wrong. It is not just a metaphorical connection. There is a literal mathematical connection in terms of how spatiotemporal, how computation or decision making in space and time operates. And this is really what I'm focusing on at the moment. So I'm going to tell you a few, uh, give you some examples of some studies that are ongoing in my lab that really draws this connection across nature in terms of how computational decisions are made. So you know, how does the brain make decisions? So we can look at decision making in a wide range of animals from this fruit fly, this what's called a model organism in biology. It's very well studied through zebrafish all the way up to complex organisms like mammals. 
And in all of these systems, when the animals are on the move, the neurons have to come to a consensus about where to go. In the fruit fly, they've got this beautiful ring. It's called an ellipsoid body. And this bump of neural activity, shown in yellow, is the decision the animal has made regarding where to go. Similarly, if you look within the vertebrate brain, such as in rodents, they don't literally have a ring, but the neural connectivity is such that it behaves like a ring. And again, you get this bump of neural activity, for example, that tells you which direction your head is facing, and so forth. So there's a consensus decision made by the neural network to decide where to go. Now, one thing that I've become really interested in is decision-making on the move. Because almost all studies that I've seen, in fact, that are out there, it's almost as if movement is an afterthought. The animal looks at options, for example, it decides, and then the movement is just the outcome of the decision. I want to argue today that that's not the case, that movement is absolutely essential and fundamental to decision-making in animals. And all animals at some point need to make decisions on the move. And so before I was thinking about a flock of birds or a school of fish, moving towards two targets and making a decision. Now I'm talking about a neural collective where individual or groups of neurons are competing with each other to make a decision of where the animal should go. And as I said, when the animal, as it moves through space, these neurons compete with each other to decide what to do. So to study this, to study how animals represent space and how animals represent time, we need to have an experimental system where we can play around with space and time. Right? In the lab, we can't do that. We can't play with the laws of physics in reality, but we can do whatever we want in virtual reality. So we had this idea to create, what if we could put animals that are freely moving that could then interact freely with photorealistic holograms? So it actually uses a very old illusion called the anamorphic illusion. I can tell you right now that this is a complete illusion. This tape does not have a volume above the table. Yet even if I tell you it's an illusion, your brain still believes it to have a volume. It's quite remarkable. And there's the illusion broken. And even if it gets put back roughly in the right place, bang, your brain will pop it back into 3D. Similarly, this shoe is not really 3D. So we thought, well, if you could then track the animal's eyes and then reconstruct in a computer, so you don't want to have to cut out bits of paper every time the animal moves, but in a computer, like on the right here, if you track the camera, which represents the eyes of the animal, the animal can move in, behind, and fully interact with any arbitrary virtual environment. Because we can't put glasses on these animals. So we use this anamorphic illusion. And so we worked with a wide range of species, including these schooling zebrafish, where we track them 100 times per second in 3D. We work out where the eyes are, and then we project onto this bowl whatever environment we want. So it looks really weird to us on the left. But from the perspective of the animal, it's just like that tape or that shoe. It appears to be in the tank with it. And the animal will avoid it, even though there's nothing there. It's just light. Similarly, we can create a photorealistic virtual fish that can swim in the tank with the real animal. Here, the virtual fish is just going on a simple circular trajectory with an orange trail, and the real fish believes this virtual fish to be in the tank with it, even though, of course, we can only project onto the surface of the bull. So it's completely convinced that this is a real individual. Now, one problem here, these are our virtual reality tanks in Constance. One problem here is I can't put more than one individual in any of these arenas. Why? because the world will look distorted to the second one. Remember when that, that paper was moved even slightly, the illusion was suddenly broken? You can only make this illusion from a very specific place. So we can only represent it to one animal at a time. But what we can do, and what we do do, is we network the systems together so the fish in the nearmost tank can interact in real time with the hologram of the fish in the second or the third tank, and vice versa. So we can now, you're seeing for the first time, two real individuals interacting not in the same physical world, but in the same holographic world. 
And they really, it's, it's indistinguishable to how they behave in the physical world. But in the holographic world, we can play around with the laws of physics, the laws of time, the laws of space, to really interrogate how does the brain do this? How does the brain make decisions? Here you can see four individuals interacting in what we call the matrix, because uh, <laughs> it's a similar concept in the movie. We're building 15 of these tanks right now. Uh, we also, I never thought I'd study this little fruit fly, but we also study the fruit fly because of the understanding of what's going on in the brain. And we also have created virtual reality for our locusts. So it's marching on a, a big uh, sphere um, that as the animal moves, we move the sphere so it's always on top. And the sphere was the biggest we could get through the door of the university. So what are we trying to study with these different experimental systems? Why study two insects and a vertebrate? Well, it's because I think there are principles of computation, of decision making, that transcend any organism, including humans. Okay, so this work is pretty new, but I'll give you a, a, some videos just to give you an impression of what we're trying to do. So what we want to understand is all animals at some point need to make decisions about where to go, whether you're a primate or whether you're a locust. But is there a common algorithm for doing so? So what we did was we created a model of how the brain works. And it's a simple model that captures generally how the insect brain works as well as how the vertebrate brain works. And we wanted to ask then, how does the brain make decisions when moving through space? So for example, towards these two options shown in red here. And we found that our model made a specific prediction that below a critical difference of angle between the options, the animal should move in the average direction, and then suddenly there's what we called a bifurcation. Suddenly the neural dynamics changes, and the animal makes a decision. And there's all sorts of cool properties of what occurs near this bifurcation that amplifies differences and so on. But you know, we were really amazed that this was reminiscent of what we'd seen with flocking and schooling before. And furthermore, most neuroscientists and psychologists just look at options, uh, two options. But animals, believe it or not, are living in a complex world where there can be larger than two, a number of two options, right? And so typical models tend to fail. But our model can scale to any number of options. But experimentally, it's quite hard to do these experiments. And so we first asked, what about three options? And what we find is we predict that the brain deals with spatial complexity by breaking the world down into a series of binary decisions. So the brain has this simplifying mechanism that works for any number of options and also produces these beautiful pictures. And of course, you know, my first interest was in pattern formation. And so suddenly, when seeing these beautiful patterns, I thought there must be some truth to this. It's too beautiful to, to, to be wrong. <laughs> and so we used our virtual reality to test it in flying animals, in flying flies. We tested it also with walking animals, these walking locusts. And we tested it in a completely different evolved brain, the vertebrate brain, in a social context. And we find that all of these different species have exactly the same bifurcations as predicted by our theory. If you look at how the animals move through space, clear evidence that the brains exhibit bifurcations for two options and also reduce the complexity of the world for more than two options. And again, we can compare the theory with the experiment also for the vertebrate brain. So we now have a new theory that transcends the organism and really tells us something new about how our animals represent space. And we're also now working on how they represent time. And what's really cool about it is like, when we were actually revising this paper, really at the end of the publication process, I suddenly realized that all flocking models are wrong. Because if you give a flocking model three options, the left would counteract the right, and they would just go down the middle. So the flocking, the animals in a flock must have something, must have a feedback mechanism reminiscent of what goes on in the brain, 
And so we also discovered that and were able to put in a forgetting behavior that's required to allow flocks to perform exactly the same behavior for the same reasons. So it really transcends the level of organization. And as I said, it produces pretty pictures. <laughs> so if I'm claiming that this is, you know, transcends these different organizations, these different brains, then if it's so robust, then we maybe could see it in the wild. So we turned to wild primates, these are baboons. Now we're using GPS collars to track the individuals. And so we put GPS on almost all of the adults within a wild, unhabituated troop. And for ethical reasons, we did not put it on juveniles. But the juveniles stay with the mothers. And all of the collars were removed at the end of the three-week experiment. But now we have every second of their lives, we have the location of each of these animals. Now, people always argued that baboons are hierarchical. The males are dominant to all of the females, and there's a dominant alpha male. If you watch TV, it's always the alpha male decides this, alpha male decides that. But no one attested that. We found no evidence of this. We found thousands of events, tens of thousands of events, where some want to go one way, some want to go another way, but the group comes to a consensus. And we could actually have enough data to compare our theory for how animal groups make these bifurcations and these decisions and so the same occurs within the brains of the baboons. So it's a democratic consensus. A juvenile female is just as important as a dominant male when it comes to deciding where to go. Now, if they get to the resource, then you can see the dominant male can completely monopolize it. So perhaps they've evolved to allow the collective intelligence to make decisions about where to go because the dominant individual can benefit from the wisdom of the crowd and then exploit the decisions made. So, to summarize, we find that there exists a common algorithm, so a common principle, a geometric principle that governs decision making. And what I find amazing is that the same algorithm occurs among the neurons within the brain as occurs among the brains within the network of communication. Natural selection has found the same principle for the same reasons across these vast scales of organization. OK, in the last part of my talk today, I want to switch to a different organism. Now, my first question for you is, what do you think this is? What do you think this represents? Just yell out some ideas. Twitter. Twitter's a great, great guess. It's very, very close. It's Facebook in this case. Actually, it could be Twitter. I forget. It's one or the other. But the point is, is that it's, a, it's a human social network. Now, what do you think the colors represent? Yeah, exactly. So the colors are a, a good clue here. So it actually represents political views. And if you think about it, when we think of political views, lots of concepts or ideals become correlated with each other. Like people's views on abortion rights correlate with their views on gun control, right? So there's this potential complexity, but it kind of reduces down. And you end up, in most places, getting relatively few parties. And so much of our society is now dominated increasingly by these online social communities. And what I'll show you today is that collective behavior impacts every aspect of your life. You think of yourself as making independent decisions. But if you actually look at the data, looking at the evidence, you're profoundly impacted by the decisions others have made in the past or that you see others make. So let me give you some examples. I'll give you some examples of relationships. Um, we make decisions uh, collectively when we're eating. You tend to copy what others eat and even synchronize your, your, when you're taking mouthfuls. Of course, decisions are made both in your private, your personal life, in your family life, as well as in your work. And all of these involve social behavior. Um, and that can be a network, for example, at, uh, in your work environment, which can differ from your social network in a, a leisure environment, for example. And of course, there are online social networks. So let's look at this first example. So choosing a partner. 
So one very important aspect of choosing a partner is how attractive you find someone. Right? Just physically attractive. It's not the only thing by any means, but it is an important aspect. Now you might think, well, I'm pretty objective about that. I know what I like and I know what I don't like. Well, it turns out that that's not the case. So in this particular study, what the authors did was they had a man of either low, medium, or high attractiveness, and they were objectively rated with no social information uh, by hundreds and hundreds of women, and so they could agree on whether this is a low attractive man, a medium attractive man, or a high attractive man. And then they did experiments where this person was then seen with a, an apparent partner, it was an actor, of different attractiveness, to then see whether the attractiveness of their apparent consort changed how women perceived the attractiveness of the man. And you think, well, that surely can't have a strong effect, but it was pretty massive. So a man of low, objective low attractiveness, if he is seen with an attractive woman that appears to be his date or his partner, is then perceived subjectively, without, this is not conscious, to be much more attractive than he otherwise would be. And this effect persists for medium and less so with high attractive individuals. So people aren't even aware, and they have not done this experiment in reverse, by the way. <laughs> but this is just an example of a subconscious bias. So it's called mate choice copying, and we find this in fish, we find this in humans. Look at this picture here. I bet you know what this picture is. <laughs> if you don't, probably something to go to the doctor about. <laughs> but, is it good? I want to ask you, right, objectively. Now, yeah, I've just told you, I've sort of given you some insight into how you might think about these things from social influence. But have you ever stopped to look at it and go, honestly, is it really one of his better works? And in actual fact, this is what you're probably more likely to see if you go to see it, right? But maybe surprising to you, it was actually a minor work that really was not well uh, perceived among his excellent works until it was stolen in 1911, right? So the painting disappears, and of course this is all over the, the newspapers of Paris, and it's what people are talking about in the cafes and coffee shops. And then things got really juicy when Pablo Picasso was implicated as <laughs> having stolen it. Right? So it suddenly became global news this painting was stolen, that this painting was being taken. In actual fact, it was a janitor in the museum that took it because he wanted to repatriate it to Italy. Right? So it was a completely, and it was, it was recovered, and you can see it today. It's famous for being famous. It was not famous before. It's probably the most famous painting now. Objectively, not that great. <laughs> in my, right? And so this is sometimes called the Justin Timberlake effect, <laughs> where someone rather average in their musical ability can be propelled to the top of the charts. And if you look at like Amazon or, or, or whatever, you know, when you see the stars, you're strongly influenced by these stars. But in actual fact, th what they will do is they will strongly bias the reviews to begin with, because that then biases your perception. Right? You will actually think a song is better if it's been reviewed well by others. You know, whereas if you don't have that information, you will be able to objectively assess the quality. Right? So again, subconscious social influence. And this type of social influence, this sort of conformity to what others are doing, can explain some of the more interesting fads and fashions uh, throughout society. Now, I love this video here. This was from a show called Candid Camera in the 60s. The gentleman in the elevator in the middle is unaware that the other people in the elevator are actors. So look at his behavior in response to those around him. We think of ourselves as being so smart. <laughs> so, 
again, of course, we are incredibly creative. We just saw a wonderful band play, and the humans are amazing at what they do. But a lot of what we do is subconsciously kind of dumb. We're just copying what those around us are doing. And especially when we consider our modern societies, these huge, beautiful cities that we live in, are very divorced from how we evolved. So what can we learn from animal collectors that can maybe help us understand ourselves a little bit better? Well, we've actually replicated these studies using sophisticated software. So this was prior to the Olympics in London, and they were very worried about potential terrorist activity. And what we realized is that people are really good at spotting apparent behavior, but they will almost never step in to do anything about it. It's called bystander apathy, right? It's the biggest problem. You'll often see adverts in subways, especially in New York City, if you see something, say something. Because the biggest problem is people see something, but they don't say. And in fact, we did this in a main railway station in London where the police, very rare in the UK, were actually armed. And we didn't want our actors to actually be, be shot. So, but no one ever, um, ever actually, so we were doing sort of simulating terrorist reconnaissance behavior. No one ever did anything about it. Yet we could detect where it was happening by looking at the gaze patterns and the copying behavior of others around. And again, what might be surprising to you is that we're so different from fish. We're so much more sophisticated. But the way that information spreads in a social network is the same. right? And so you may think that individuals with many connections to other individuals are more influential. That's not the case. Having few strong links tends to be much more influential. Right? And also, um, we've been able to show how information spreads within these types of collectives. And that's why Damon Santola, on his book about the science of complex contagion, uses our fish for the cover. Because again, you know, I, I find it kind of amazing that there are these conserved principles across these systems. So have you ever stopped to think, what is information? Can anyone throw out a definition to me right now? What is information? Okay, so that's something that can be acted upon. But I could be telling you complete nonsense today, right? How do you know what I'm telling you may or may not be true? Yeah, you may act upon something that's not true, right? People do this all the time. And so information, technically, is the removal of uncertainty. And to remove uncertainty, there needs to be some truth to it. But as was just correctly said a moment ago, we often copy the behavior or opinions of others without validating them independently. In fact, we often talk about people who are not present. Talking about third parties who are not present is gossip. So what proportion of, what percentage of your time do you think, on average, you gossip about other people? 40% I heard. Anyone got another guess? 50, 70. You know what? This is collective intelligence. If I could add up all your guesses and look at the average, it's probably going to be pretty close to the truth, which is around 65%. That is a lot of time we're spending gossiping about other people. We love to gossip. And gossiping probably was fundamentally important in our evolution. But we evolved in small family-knit communities. We did not evolve in large cities, right? So gossip in these types of environments can only go so far. It can easily be corrected. But what about gossip within modern societies? What about if we're using internet or using mass media? This is a completely different world, a world that we haven't evolved in. A world like this, where you've got global connectivity with near instantaneous transmission of information. How does this impact gossip? Well, it turns out that there's this beautiful phrase. No one knows who said this. Some people think it was Mark Twain, but no one really knows. A lie can travel halfway around the world while the truth is putting on its shoes. And there's a heck of a lot of truth to this. 
So the science of understanding information has really exploded with these online networks because we can quantify the information. You've all heard of fake news. So this work by Sinan Aral and colleagues looked at the spread of true and false news online. And it turns out that false news spreads much faster and much deeper in social networks than does truth. Right? That's pretty scary. And why do you think that is? More interesting? Outrage. Outrage, exactly. Yep. Any other thoughts? So I didn't catch that? Less nuanced. Less nuanced, so simpler to understand perhaps. More Creates more discussion. All of these are, are true. They're out of your own boredom. <laughs> that seems like a bit of a personal statement there. <laughs> I, oh, I recommend the cocktail. <laughs> so why is this the case? Well, many of you were intuitively correct. It's because false news inspires fear, disgust, surprise. It inspires emotional states, right? If you want to make news surprising, what's easier than making it up? It's the best way to make surprising information. And so if you think about yourselves and your daily lives, be really careful what you listen to in terms of gossip, because it's more likely, probabilistically, to be false than true. Right? And it spreads very deeply and can actually be very damaging. Now, I think this is now a speculation. Within uh, the sort of societies that we evolved in, the truth did have time to catch up and inoculate the lies right? in those small hunter-gatherer type societies. But nowadays, it's impossible. Right? And there's many examples of this. And what about this aspect? What about polarization? where individuals tend to be connected to those that think like themselves. How does this impact collective intelligence or collective decision making? And in fact, this level of extreme polarization, this is 2017, is probably much worse now. You can actually quantify this looking, sorry, it's a bit small here, but this is 1949 going up to 2011 in the bottom right. And this is US Congress on bipartisan bills. So connections between the red and the blue, which you can see are very common in 1949. So the politicians doing what they should be doing, working together for the benefit of society. What we're seeing now, already by 2011, is voting by party lines that is directly against the interests of the community. It's absolutely uh, perverse. And it's, it's very, very hard to stop. So how do you think this type of polarization impacts collective decisions? Well, it turns out we don't have a huge amount of data on this. And so working with Joe Back Coleman, who was a PhD student with me, we were kind of shocked when Trump was elected. And we thought, well, we've been studying collective behavior for so many years. Why have we never tried to understand political decisions and how political views may be influenced decision making. And so we took a very large sample size within the United States. I'm just going to finish my cocktail. <laughs> ah, lovely. Um, so we could then, uh, using a variety of ways, look at whether people were very liberal to very conservative. And by very conservative, I mean extreme far right. right? So we've got the full spectrum here. And what was surprising to us is that we asked a wide range of questions that had nothing to do with politics. Things like, what's the state capital of New Jersey? What's the perimeter of Switzerland? All sorts of general knowledge questions. And everyone tends to be, the more likely you are to be correct, you know that you're inaccurate, you know you're accurate, and your confidence is scaled appropriately. You're more confident when you have the right answer. Very functional, except the far right. <laughs> the more confident they were that they were right, the more likely they were they were factually wrong. And so we thought, well, that's weird. So we did it again. We got the same result again. <coughs> the other thing about the far right is everyone, except the far right, 
will utilize social information if available. The far right will only utilize it if it agrees with what they already think, which completely devalues the benefits of collective intelligence. There's no benefit to that at all. Furthermore, we could also show that a small proportion of far-right individuals, if you have the polarized social networks, can actually bring the collective intelligence of the conservatives, who, by the way, normal conservatives are completely rational, but this small proportion of, of far-right could bring the collective wisdom down of a large number of others that they're connected to on these networks. Right? So it's quite scary that these extremists who can find each other on the internet can actually seemingly exert such strong influence. So can we do anything about it? Are we doomed as a society to increase polarization? Well, I don't know, but I'm an optimist. So I'm going to try to argue a few ways that we can benefit from understanding animals that could help us. So they're my four secrets to making smart decisions. And you can take it away with you tonight, and hopefully, <laughs> there's no legal promises here, but hopefully this will help you uh, make smarter decisions in your life. So what do we know about the science here? So actually, when studying animal groups, I discovered that actually having uninformed individuals or unbiased individuals in the collective allowed the group to minimize extremism and to promote democratic consensus. And that might seem bizarre that we discovered this with fish. In fact, it did not impress Rand Paul, who some of you may know. He went on Fox News and said he was going to call Obama to cut all of my funds. I was based at Princeton University at the time. He said I got 5.2 million in a military study on goldfish. None of that's correct. <laughs> but Rand Paul doesn't care so much about facts. Um, and uh, yeah, so it, it didn't go so well for him. But in fact, Nick Christakis, a colleague at Yale University, has indeed shown even in humans Having unbiased or uh, uninformed individuals, they act as a sort of social glue. They prevent the two extremist sides from never being able to communicate with each other. They act as a conduit of information. And so it's not so bizarre. It actually makes sense. So my first tip is that actually you know, we tend to exclude individuals that don't have strong preferences. We tend to listen to those who are vocal and strongly opinionated. And I would argue it's very important to increase diversity and specifically to have individuals that are unbiased involved in decision making, not excluded from it. So that's the first lesson. What else makes for a smart group? It might be you think, you know, the average intelligence of individuals in a group might matter. Let's get a bunch of smart people together in a room and let them make the decisions. Maybe you should just have a super smart individual in the group and maybe it's their intelligence that makes the whole group smarter. And this is partly due to our human obsession with individual intelligence. Albert Einstein was a very rare phenomenon. Most human decisions are made collectively. It's not this individualistic genius idea is super rare. Right? So if we actually think about groups making decisions, you, there's actually a study by um, Wooly et al. in Science that they showed that the group's decision, they looked at 15 different types of problems, from video games to architectural design and many others, and they found it did not correlate with average IQ, it did not correlate with maximum IQ, it was something about the group, something about the collective intelligence of the group that made that group really smart and really good across these different tasks. And then they asked, what is it about these groups? And they found it was the proportion of women the more women in the group, and this has been replicated many times, the smarter the group is across these vastly different parts. It is also International Women's Day today. But, so re really, this should be a woman speaking today, not me. But anyway, I, I, I didn't think of that either. Um, 
But groups of the one woman make better decisions. That's a fact. I'm not trying to be PC here. That's just a fact. That's what the scientific evidence tells us. But we can learn from that, right? Why is this the case? Well, it turns out really to be about communication. If you go to a bookstore <laughs> and you look up the business section of a bookstore, this is the type of crap you have to deal with. <laughs> And if you watch TV shows like Suits or some shit, this <laughs> is the kind of crap that we're, you know, we're, we're told to be. Guys have to be like this, right? It's completely toxic. And it, it, it's insane. So really, groups become dumb if one or two people dominate the conversation, and that's what tends to happen with men in groups. <laughs> Again, I'm, this is just a fact. The men need to be trained to turn take, to allow decisions to be made. So networks of egalitarian communication, which spontaneously happen in groups of women, make for much, much better decisions. Finally, what about group size? I'm kind of amazed that we still don't know what size to make a group to make good decisions. Whether you talk to businessmen, whether you talk to scientists, no one knows what is the best group size or what range of group sizes works. But we've done some work on this, and it's suggestive that in actual fact, you know, too many cooks really do spoil the broth, and that small groups of around two to 10 individuals tend to make much better decisions. So the other tip is really don't let groups get too large when making decisions. Small groups make better decisions, partly because the randomness, the noise, the error is important. It allows you to explore idea space in ways that big groups get trapped in a way of thinking that is maladaptive. So if we then think about larger structured organizations that are beyond, of course, this small number of individuals, we've also shown that if you organize groups of groups, so small groups that are interconnected with each other, that tends to make much better decisions. But it's really surprising to me that this is new, that this is science that we don't yet know how to compose groups. So I hope to have shown you today, these are my, my four takeaway messages to making smart decisions. Allow diverse opinions, including weak opinions. Listen to others. Allow everyone to be heard. A cheap, easy way to make better decisions <laughs> is to have more women in groups because it just happens spontaneously. Much harder to train men to take turns, but in theory it's possible. <laughs> and bigger is not always better. Thanks very much for coming tonight. <laughs>